Thank you guys all for being here. We are here for Terry Stops and Pat Downs. I'm John Wien with Blue to Gold Law Enforcement Training. Let's get into it. First things first, we wouldn't be attorneys if we didn't have disclaimers. So here they are. Your laws and your SOPs may be more restrictive, right? This is a nationwide class. As you guys just saw, we got officers from across the nation here. So if you guys are one of our more restrictive states, I'm looking at you, New Mexico, Washington, Oregon, New Jersey, right? Uh, if you guys are one of our outlier states, Pennsylvania, yep. If you guys are one of our outlier states, make sure that you guys are familiar not only with the federal standard, but also your state standards. In addition, even in those states like Arizona, California, that are construing their state constitution in keeping with the federal standard, you also have to know your own individual policies. So keep in mind your state laws and your own individual policies may be more restrictive. If you have any doubts, push it up the chain, get your chain of command involved. And finally, this course is legal education, not legal advice. I'm an attorney, I'm not your attorney. If you guys have access to a legal advisor, if you have access to a prosecutor, rely on their good counsel because they will have far more of an impact on how your investigation and how your case proceeds through the court system than I will. First up, grounds to detain. So let's talk about when you're having an interaction with a citizen, right? As a law enforcement officer, when you're having an interaction with a citizen, what different legal standards do we have to meet? What can we do? What can't we do? So first up, hunches, right? Hunches indicate a slight possibility of illegal activity and cannot be used to search or seize. And I will tell you guys right now, like we talk about in our Bulletproof Report writing class, Hunch, treat it like a dirty word, okay? Take that out of your vocabulary. Hunch, courts hate hunches. And if they feel like you are just relying on a hunch, they will make sure that that is brought to your attention. There is a whole lot of case law out there where the government's arguing reasonable suspicion and the defense attorney responds, no, it was just a hunch. And so we don't ever want the court to believe that we were just relying on a hunch. So take that one out of your vocabulary if a defense attorney ever asks you. So basically you just had a hunch. The answer is never, yeah, no, right? No, no hunches. The officer must point to specific articulable facts. Inchoate suspicions and unparticular hunches do not provide reasonable suspicion, okay? However, is a hunch still valuable to you? Yes, it is, right? You can use hunches if you want to go over and initiate a consensual encounter, right? If you're looking at something, you say, yeah, that just seems kind of weird. I say to you, you need to up your articulation game because you are seeing something that is setting off your cop radar. And if you're just like, yeah, I don't know, I just had a hunch, that means you're seeing it, but you are not able to effectively apply it to your background training experience and interpret it such that later on you can recall what it was exactly about that situation that made the hair on the back of your neck stand up, all right? So we compare hunches to reasonable suspicion, right? Reasonable suspicion requires a moderate chance of illegal activity. So not a high standard, but a standard nonetheless. When we talk about reasonable suspicion, that is the legal standard you must reach in order to have a basis to detain, right? And so reasonable suspicion. All right, Sean, tell me how I'm doing, man. All right. If you're teaching on this academy, tell me how I'm doing. All right. We'll compare notes later. So reasonable suspicion is a moderate chance of illegal activity. And when we talk about reasonable suspicion, we talk about detention, you know what we have to talk about. We have to talk about the landmark seminal case, Terry v. Ohio, right? And there it is right there, October 31st, 1963, the police report of Detective Martin J. McFadden. And on October 31st, 1963, Detective McFadden was walking his beat in the area of 13th and Euclid. And as he was so engaged, he saw a group of three men standing on a street corner. And something about him piqued his interest, right? They were looking around, kind of shifty, right? And they were wearing clothing that really wasn't consistent with the weather. And so he decided he was going to hang back and just watch. And as he did so, he saw one of the group break off and walk over and look in the window of a nearby jewelry store at 1276 East Euclid Avenue. And so he saw that, 
And the guy looked in the window, then walked back, met with his two compatriots and started conferring. And so, you know, is he just doing some window shopping? Is he thinking about popping that big question? And so, you know, he's just kind of trying to, you know, get up, get up the, the courage to do it and go in there and buy that ring. But I don't know, right? Maybe, maybe there's a possible explanation. But as Detective McFadden sits back and watches, one of the group breaks off, goes up, looks in the window. They do this about a dozen times. And so ultimately, Detective McFadden, based on his experience, looks at that and he says, these guys are casing this place for a robbery. And so he walks over, he orders them up against the wall, frisks them, and finds out that two of them are carrying illegal firearms, right? And what I love about this is these three guys, right? It's Terry, Katz, and Chilton. And so, like, you've got some really famous case names, and really Terry's the only one that made it through in this case, right? Katz, Chilton, those are other cases. But also the defendant's name in this case. There's the area today. Ultimately, when he frisked him, he found two of them. Terry got two years for the gun, right? Now, Terry appeals up to the United States Supreme Court, right? And he argues... This was a violation of my rights. Why? Because I will tell you guys, the reason why this case is so fascinating, at the time, 1963, there were two kinds of police encounters. There was a consensual encounter where no reasonable suspicion was needed, right? Even no, no standard was needed. You could just go up and talk to somebody or an arrest based on probable cause. That was it. It was one or the other. And this was, this was something new, right? Because admittedly, admittedly, McFadden didn't have probable cause to believe these guys had committed a crime. Instead, he said, based on these reasons, I believed these guys were about to go and commit a crime. They were going to do this, right? And I will tell you guys, looking at this, I think a defense attorney has a easier argument here, don't you? I mean, do we really want to create this legal standard where we allow police officers to take away someone's liberty, to take away their freedom, to restrict their movement based on their suspicions because the officer thinks this person may commit a crime? I mean, are, are we going to empower our law enforcement officers, our brothers and sisters with that ability, this, this, this like God-like ability to see into the future and say, yeah, I'm going to restrict your freedom of movement. I'm going to detain you even though you haven't done anything wrong yet. I mean, that's scary. That's scary when you think about it. We recognize it as an incredibly valuable tool, but at the time, this was incredibly novel thinking. And so I got to ask you guys, right? Do you agree society is better off because McFadden stopped Terry before the armed robbery? Think about that. Think about had the United States Supreme Court come out differently on this? How much different would your job be? How much different would society be? Terry v. Ohio tells us when a police officer has reasonable suspicion, that is, specific articulable facts, more than a mere hunch to believe a person is, was, or is about to be engaged in criminal activity, the officer can detain that person for a reasonable amount of time to either confirm their suspicions, equaling probable cause and an arrest, or to dispel their suspicions, at which time the person must be immediately released, right? I mean, now we have this incredibly valuable tool and a pretty snazzy plaque on the site today, right? And this says, on October 31st, 1963, the actions of Cleveland Police Detective Martin J. McFadden led to a new legal standard allowing police officers in the United States to stop and frisk suspicious persons prior to committing a crime. On that day, McFadden had spotted three men loitering outside a jewelry store at 1276 Euclid Avenue. Believing a robbery was about to take place, the 38-year veteran stopped the men and checked them for weapons. Two of them had guns and were charged with and convicted of carrying concealed weapons. The law at the time allowed officers to stop a suspect only after a crime was committed. They appealed their case all the way to the United States Supreme Court. In a landmark decision on June 10, 1968, Chief Justice Earl Warren delivered the court's opinion that McFadden's action, called a Terry stop after one of the suspects, was justifiable. Huge case, right? And so when we talk about making good case law, guys, we talk about how each and every one of you, as law enforcement officers, you have an incredible amount of power, right? You have the ability to take away someone's freedom 
their liberty, right? Their freedom of movement with little more than your word. Okay, it's an incredibly amount, incredible amount of power. But in addition to that, you have an incredible responsibility to your fellow law enforcement officers and to society as a whole. Why? Because through your actions on each and every case you, every call you respond to, every case you investigate, every single case that you go on, every call for service, you have the ability to either empower law enforcement officers with the tools they need for generations to come just like Detective McFadden did, or if you fail to articulate why what you did was reasonable, you have the ability to strip them of the same, right? On one hand, you've got Terry v. Ohio, fantastic articulation, 38 years of law enforcement experience, an invaluable tool that law enforcement officers now have. On the other side of that, we've got several examples, right? Arizona versus Gantt springs to mind. Through the failure to articulate, we are stripping law enforcement officers of the tools they need to protect our societies. Make good case law. Each and every one of you, every call for service has the ability. Every call for service could be the next United States Supreme Court case. If you guys get a chance, I want you to get out, get out there and check out United States versus Arvisu, right? United States versus Arvisu. Now, this is an interesting case, right? Basically, what's going on, we are in southern Arizona, right? The southwest of the United States. And we got a border patrol agent. And he is driving through the area. They get a notification from a sensor in an area that's known for human and narcotics trafficking, right? And so he responds to the area. And I got to tell you guys, this case is fantastic from a training perspective right? Why? Because this Border Patrol agent's articulation is great, right? He goes through boom, 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 and hits these high points as to why he believed this was a suspicious vehicle, okay? He pulls the vehicle over. He makes contact with the occupants. Ultimately, a significant amount of narcotics is found, okay? The occupants of the vehicle, the driver arrested for, convicted of, they appeal up to the Ninth Circuit, now, what's interesting is the Ninth Circuit engages in an analysis in determining whether or not the officer had reasonable suspicion. That is, specific articulable facts, more than a mere hunch to believe the person is, was, or is about to be engaged in criminal activity. And the Ninth Circuit went through and they engaged in kind of this piecemeal divide and conquer analysis. And they said, ultimately, the officer did not have reasonable suspicion to you know, believe that this vehicle was engaged in criminal activity. Here is what the United States Supreme Court pointed out that the officer articulated when they overruled the Ninth Circuit and said, Ninth Circuit, notoriously wrong, Ninth Circuit. Again, you are wrong. Walk through this with me, guys. First things first, the sensor went off at shift change. Okay, why is that relevant? Well, the agent articulated that traffickers try to schedule their runs for shift change where they believe that officers won't be as diligent or they'll be able to get sneak through in the gap. No other vehicles in the area, right? And so we know that no other vehicle traffic, no other foot traffic. This vehicle is standing out. This person is standing out. The type of vehicles smugglers were known to use, okay? A minivan, all right? And so is this officer applying his background training experience? Absolutely, but it's not just saying they were driving a minivan. So what, right? I drive a minivan. No, I don't. But just, call, just saying, yeah, it's a minivan. It isn't enough, right? You got to say it was a minivan. So what? Tell me why. And he did. The driver appeared stiff with a rigid posture. He avoided eye contact by looking straight ahead, right? Usually when you guys drive past people, right? When you drive and you pull up next to other vehicles, people looking over at you, right? They do the, the double take, right? They're like, oh, cop, right? Yeah, okay. This dude, no, there's no other vehicle traffic out there, but you got a law enforcement officer driving through you, no other cars, and yet you don't look, right? Don't look, la, 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 straight ahead, okay? Straight ahead. The knees of the children in the back seat were high, as if their feet were resting on something. Is that beautiful? That is beautiful. I love this, right? I love this. The children began to wave at the agent simultaneously in an abnormal pattern as if they were being instructed, right? Dad's like, wave at that cop. You wave at that cop and you smile and you do not stop waving until I say. <laughs> 
The children continued to waving for about four minutes, right? I don't know about you guys, but 45 seconds, I'd be like, dad, I'm sweating, right? I'm, I'm like, uh, hold it up, right? Hold it up, okay? That's like, uh, that's like, you know, royalty status right there, man. Signal to turn, then turn signal off, then signaled abruptly before quickly turning. Trying to avoid the officer, nervous, evasive behavior. Vehicle turned at last road before checkpoint onto a four by four road. And the officer stated that he did not believe the minivan was a four wheel drive car. Does this officer have familiarity with this area? Absolutely. Agent had never seen the vehicle in the area before. The agent actually articulated that he knew people who frequented the area. They would go out there and they'd take out their quads or they'd do off-roading, right? He said he was familiar with people who came into this really remote area and he had never seen this vehicle there before. It's great. Vehicle registration returns to an area known for alien and narcotics smuggling, okay? So what do you guys think? Based on the totality of the circumstances, do we have reasonable suspicion? Is there a moderate chance the occupant of this vehicle is engaged in criminal activity? Ninth Circuit said no. United States Supreme Court said absolutely. In making a reasonable suspicion determination, reviewing courts must look at the totality of the circumstances of each case to see whether the detaining officer has a particularized and objective basis for suspecting legal wrongdoing. This process allows officers to draw on their own experiences and specialized training to make inferences from and deductions about the cumulative information available. Keep in mind, if your reasonable suspicion is so generic that it would allow a detention of many people based on those same facts, then it is not reasonable. Given the specialized training and experience that law enforcement officers have, we generally defer to their ability to distinguish between innocent and suspicious behavior. But deference becomes inappropriate when an officer relies on a circumstance incorrigibly free of associations with criminal activity. Okay. And so guys, for those of you who are out there in the 10th circuit, right, we're seeing a lot of hostility, a lot of hostility toward interdiction in the 10th circuit. Okay. Be aware, be aware. Police see a car parked at apartments known as a place where many stolen vehicles have been recovered. Many of the stolen vehicles had Texas buyer temp tags because they are easy to buy online. Cops see an occupied vehicle in the lot with a Texas buyer's tag and detain the occupants. Car ultimately determines to be stolen. All right. So what do you guys think? Is this RS? Is this RS? High crime area. Lots of stolen vehicles there. Many of them have te Texas buyer's temp tags on them. I drive by. I see a car. Texas buyer temp tag. Yoink. Can I detain that person? The answer is no, right? The answer is no. This stop was unlawful. If upheld, it would mean police could routinely stop every car that matched those facts, right? And so again, right? Sean says it's a hunch. So what do we do with hunch? First off, we never use that word. <laughs> we never use that word. Take that out of your vocabulary. But are they still valuable? The answer is yes, right? Why? Because they can point you in the right direction. They can lead you to consensual encounters. So can you walk up on that vehicle and take a little peek around, right? Like, hey, man, what's going on tonight, right? What's happening? Oh, man, somebody, somebody removed your VIN plate. That's weird, right? Investigate and articulate. There it is. Tell me why. Beautiful. All right. Let's talk about unidentifiable tipsters, guys. Let's talk about unidentifiable tipsters. Because the person who is reporting the crime to you, does it matter who that person is? In a determination of reasonable suspicion, the answer is absolutely, right? An anonymous tip is from someone you have no idea who it is. A known person who doesn't want to get involved or be identified is an informant, and those people fall under those rules, okay? All right? So if you know who they are, even if they don't want to be involved, even if they say, no, don't contact me, don't follow up with me, if you have their contact information, then they are not truly anonymous tipsters, all right? If we are treating somebody as a truly anonymous tipster, it's going to be something like, 
They're calling from a payphone. For those of you guys who remember what those are, I have seen them out there. They're still out there, right? In my travels, I've seen them. 911 only phone, a burner phone, right? I borrow somebody else's phone, whatever it is. This is a truly anonymous tipster, meaning I don't know who they are. I don't have a way of following up with them, okay? If they call in and tell your dispatcher, you know, like they call 911, but they say, I don't want to be involved. Don't, don't have the officer contact me. I still got their phone number. I still got their information, right? Okay, so let's, let's treat it like that, okay? Let's, let's take that into consideration. That is an informant, not a truly anonymous tipster. You must corroborate truly anonymous tips. Corroboration means inside information. And like we talked about, what about people who don't want to get involved or confidential informants, okay? If it's somebody who doesn't want to get involved or if it's a confidential informant, you need to tell me why the caller is reliable and explain how the caller knows what he knows, right? So you're going to have to convince a judge, right? You're going to have to convince a subsequent trier of fact. This is why I believed this known informant was reliable. This is why I believe this confidential informant was reliable. This is why I believe this person who didn't want to be involved, but who we could have contacted was reliable. And then tell me how he or she knows what they know. What is their basis of knowledge? In rely under reliability, we look at this. We say past performance, especially convictions, right? What have they done for you in the past? Are they a worker, right? Are they a worker? How many arrests have they made? How many convictions have they got? How much drugs have you recovered as a result? Okay. Um, how many, you know, whatever it is, right? How, how, however, however much money they've recovered, however much property they've recovered. Okay. Um, Texas can run those tags. And then, oh, cross-reference the VIN attached to it, see if it matches the vehicle. If it comes back to a different vehicle, that we can piece of stock, correct? Brian, absolutely, right? Absolutely, man. I mean, so it's, we talk about plain view, right? Can I just run a tag with zero level of articulation? The answer is yes. It's plain view. What a person willingly exposes to public view, they can be said to have no reasonable expectation of privacy in it. So if you have a plate you can run, then yeah, you can run it and see if it comes back and see if see what it, see what it matches or what it doesn't, right? Um, the issue is, you know, on some buyer tags, they're just, you know, they don't even have, they don't even have code numbers or they're temporary or whatever, right? Um, so a lot of states, that's an issue, okay? Yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of different things that some states do with their DMV. Uh, and so it's, it's shady. But again, right, guys, it's not a high standard. It's a moderate chance, okay? So don't ever tell me it's just the buyer tag, right? Find something else. If your vehicle code is as thick as mine is, you should be able to find something else, okay? All right. So declaration against interest. If you have a known informant or a confidential informant and they're coming in and they're saying, hey, listen, I was involved in you know these crimes, right? I was involved in staking the place out. I was involved in the robbery. But then once we got inside, you know, my partner started kidnapping people and I want none of that, right? I want none of that. So that's got nothing to do with me. And so do I understand I'm not getting any deal on the conspiracy to commit robbery. I understand I'm not getting any deal on the robbery itself fully. I understand that. The only reason why I'm coming forward is to tell you guys, you know, I'm admitting I did wrong. I'm admitting I'll be punished for those, but not for the kidnapping or the murder or wherever it went from there, right? Declaration against interest. Then you got your disinterested citizen, okay? What is their motivation? Well, their motivation is stopping crime, helping the police, reducing crime in their neighborhood, being a good Samaritan, whatever it is. Basically, they are not in the game, right? They're not a criminal. They're just a disinterested citizen. They're just an innocent civilian who lives in the area, right? And then finally, corroboration, okay? Corroboration. Basically, if somebody tells me something, okay? And I can, I can corroborate, I can confirm, they're telling me A, B, C, and D, and I can confirm A, and I can confirm B, and I can confirm C, chances are D is going to be, there's a moderate chance, right? D is going to be true as well. So corroborate, 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 corroborate. Now, how do I articulate a basis of knowledge, right? How do I articulate a basis of knowledge? First-hand observations, or again, your corroboration, right? Are they telling you something that's happening right then and there? There's an increased um, 
an increased reliability there, right? Because if somebody calls in and says, hey, if you get to the corner of first and third right now, there is a full-on fight going on versus, hey, there was a full-on fight going on three days ago, right? I show up there at the intersection. I'm like, whatever, right? Versus I pull into the area and they're telling me it's happening right now. And now I see people scattering and I see cars driving off. Awesome. Now we've got firsthand observations, right? And I'm able to corroborate at least some of the information they're providing, okay? Other factors to consider. Are they truly anonymous, right? That's what we got to know, okay? Are they providing current firsthand information? That's what we talked about, right? It's happening now versus it happened before. If you don't act, what is the future harm? And guys, this is huge, right? This is huge. If you don't act, what is the future harm? Have that question answered in your head if you are dealing with truly anonymous tips, okay? Because every Fourth Amendment analysis the court will weigh the governmental or societal interest against the infringement on the individual's rights. If there is a future harm, then there is a significant governmental interest in preventing that type of crime, right? Okay, so always, it's always a balancing test, all right? All right, um, does the tipster have a good motive? Can you tell from what they are saying when they're calling you what their motivation is? And then again, corroborate, right? Corroborate, show that inside knowledge. I'm going to tell you guys right now, if you are ever dealing with a truly anonymous tipster, the defense attorney or the civil rights attorney is going to try to compare the facts of your case to those of Florida versus JL, right? Florida versus JL is the case when it comes to anonymous tipsters. In this case, a truly anonymous tipster called law enforcement and said, hey, there is an African-American male sitting at a bus stop at First and Figueroa wearing a plaid shirt. He's carrying a gun. Officers responded. They saw a African-American male wearing a plaid shirt sitting at the bus stop at First and Figueroa. They got out. They drew down on him. They ordered him up against the bus stop. They frisked him and they found an illegally carried firearm. And so the question is, was this reasonable suspicion to believe that this guy was armed and dangerous? right? Was this reasonable suspicion to believe this guy was armed and dangerous? So let's walk through our factors, right? Let's walk through our factors. Are they truly anonymous? The answer is yes. In this case, Florida versus jail, they were truly anonymous. Are they providing current firsthand information? The answer is yes. Beautiful. All right. Versus, yeah, it happened three days ago. Awesome. If you don't act, future harm. What is it? I don't know right? I don't know. And again, is this caller even reporting a crime? Ultimately, yeah, we determined he's underage and he's illegally carrying a firearm, right? Underage and illegally carrying a firearm. But here's the thing, okay? Here's the thing. It wasn't like we're threatening, yeah, he's gonna go shoot the school up or something, right? He's carrying a gun. Okay, maybe he's legally carrying that firearm, okay? All right. And then is the tipster have good motive? I don't know. And then did we corroborate any kind of inside information? And the answer is no. Is it just as possible that this is someone who saw this African-American guy sitting here at the bus stop and says, I'm going to use the cops as a tool of harassment, right? This is going to be funny. For those of you guys who experienced swatting before, right? Nothing funny about swatting, right? Nothing funny about it, man. That is, that is, that's, uh, and that, that's, that's, that should be the death penalty right there as far as I'm concerned. But I digress, right? And so what is the inside information? What is the corroboration? There is none. And the United States Supreme Court said this bare bones tip was insufficient to justify stop and frisk, okay? So you guys need to be familiar with Florida versus JL, right? You need to be familiar with Florida versus JL. Why? Because every call that you respond to, if it is truly anonymous, if your dispatcher, your dispatcher should know the difference, right? If they don't, try to have a conversation with them about it, okay? Is it truly anonymous or is it just somebody who doesn't want to be involved? Because if it's truly anonymous, you need to compare it to the facts of Florida versus JL and say, are we Florida versus JL or are we somewhere else, okay? There you go, all right? Tell me the difference. Tell me the difference if it's not Florida versus JL. If it is Florida versus JL, Make that consensual encounter. Don't detain. An anonymous caller told 911 there was a full-on fight in a backyard. Dispatch heard yelling, banging noises, and a woman repeatedly yelling stop. 
Officers arrived six minutes later and heard no fight, but still entered the backyard. What do you guys think? What do you think? Is this Florida versus JL or is this something else? Yeah. I like it. I like it. So what's the big difference here, guys? Is there a, a crime, right? Is there potentially future harm? And who got who got it? Who got it? Wait, let me see. Wait, 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 wait. Ah! <laughs> Devin, Devin says dispatcher heard noises, right? Yeah, Devin says the fight's over because, you know, somebody's straight up, you know, the egg, the eggshell thin skull, right? And we've got corroboration by the dispatcher. Love it, right? The background noise corroborated the tip and exigent circumstances existed when police entered the backyard. All good. Tell me why, right? Tell me why. All right, guys. Navarrete versus California, 2014 case, right? Navarrete versus California. Now, in this case, caller called in and said, um, you know, or dispatcher relayed, showing southbound Highway 1 at mile marker 88, Silver Ford pickup, plate of 8 David 94925, ran RP off the roadway and was last seen approximately five ago, okay? And so 20 minutes later, 20 miles south on Highway 1, 20 miles south of mile marker 88, California Highway Patrol see a silver Ford pickup displaying plate 8 David 94925. All right. The California Highway Patrol observes no violation. So is this RS to stop that vehicle? <laughs> I'm getting a lot of no's. I'm getting Amanda saying yes. Say, I got some more no's. I got some more yeses. This is tough, right? All right. This is tough, right? Because look at this, guys. And we're talking about this. Should I get my own RS, right? Should I wait? Should I get my own violation? Okay. J Jason, the, the info from dispatch is right there, baby. It's on the screen. That's what the officer got. Okay. And so... Should you get your own, your own RS? Should you get your own freeze for the stop? Yes, right? Identify your own RS for the stop. Identify your own PC for the stop. And then you're good. But if you don't, right? If you don't, is this RS? And here is what I'll tell you guys. In this case, not a truly anonymous tipster. This was a 911 caller. Okay? Not a truly anonymous tipster. Does that change things for you? It absolutely should, right? It absolutely should. And so the officer makes the stop. He makes contact with Navarrete, right? And uh, ultimately he determines that uh, Navarrete is driving under the influence and there is a significant amount of methamphetamine inside the vehicle, okay? So up to the United States Supreme Court we go. And the question is, is this RS? And the United States Supreme Court says... Government, tell me why. And the government tells you this, okay? Contemporaneous, meaning near in time. Future location predicted. First-hand information. Detailed description of vehicle, right? It wasn't like silver Ford pickup. Oh, there's one, there's one, there's one. Proper motive, assumedly, right? Highway safety, risk of future harm. Sure, the government said there's a significant risk um, there's a significant governmental interest in preventing highway deaths from DUI drivers. Excessive time did not elapse before the stop. And tell me, guys, what does 20 minutes and 20 miles tell us, right? The call comes in here. 20 minutes later, I find the vehicle and it called. It comes in at mile marker 88. It's reported at mile marker 88. I find it 20 miles away. 20 minutes, 20 miles. The vehicle is probably traveling. Who's good at math? 60 miles an hour, right? Thereabouts, probably a little bit faster. And so did this silver F-150 stop and like start drinking a bunch or change the driver out? No, right? The same guy who's driving 20 miles ago and 20 minutes ago, pretty darn certain he's the same guy driving now, right? And so ultimately, this is not Florida versus JL. But here's the thing, guys. What I love about this is 
could the caller have been charged with, could the caller have been charged with false reporting? The answer is yes, right? Because why? This was a 911 call. We've got the follow-up, right? We have the follow-up. But here's the thing. In this case, get this, guys. They never called the caller back, right? They never called the caller back. They never got firsthand account, right? But here's the thing. They could have. And so the fact that the court said you could have, guess what? You have recompense. If ultimately it turns out, we pull this vehicle over, we make contact with the driver and we say, hey, you know, did you have an issue with somebody like 20 miles ago? And he's like, no. And we're like, oh yeah, we got a call that maybe you ran somebody off the road, right? And he's like, oh, who called you? And we're like, well, we, I can't tell you that, sir. And he's like, well, how about this? I'll tell you who called, right? It was, here's the phone number. It's 555-2876. Dispatch, can you confirm the last four of those phone number? Yep, right? Exactly. Amanda's got it. it Amanda says, it's my crazy ex-wife calling in. <laughs> and he says, that's why. She calls all the time. She harasses me all the time. She always calls the cops and tries to use the police as a tool of harassment. What can we now do? Can we help Navarrete? Can we help him be protected from having the police used as a tool of harassment? Absolutely, because we say, guess what? Oh, well, well then, sir. Well then, would you like to be a victim? Help us aid in you know, for false reporting? 100%, right? She was Puerto Rican. She was spicy, but it wasn't worth it. She's making my life a living hell ever since we broke up, okay? And so get this. There is somebody out there, right, who made this call... Someday driving down, you know, Highway 1 in California and never got any follow-up from the police and has no idea that the call that they made ended up with a United States Supreme Court case, right? <laughs> I love it. I love it. And that's a great, that's a great practice, Jeff. The motorist use of 911 system provided another indicator of her veracity since that system had features that allowed for identifying and tracing callers, thereby providing some safeguards against making false reports. An investigatory stop is a well-established exception to a search or seizure conducted without a warrant. When an anonymous tip is conveyed through a 911 call and contains sufficient information to trigger public safety concerns and to provide an ability to identify the person, a police officer may undertake an investigatory stop of that individual. And so tell me, guys, is Navarrete versus California telling me if I have a known caller, right, not truly anonymous about a possible DUI driver, and I get behind that vehicle, and as soon as I get behind it, it pulls into a parking lot and parks legally. Do I have RS for that vehicle if it is a known caller per Navarrete versus California? The answer is yes even if I have no personal observation. If it is a truly anonymous tipster, you're going to have a harder time making that case. You're going to have to articulate risk of future harm. 14-year-old called 911 and said, boys were standing in the parking lot by gray and greenish charger, just out there playing with guns. Okay? So that's the call. There's boys standing in the parking lot by a gray and greenish charger, just out there playing with guns. He told 911 that he borrowed a customer's phone at the Mickey D's across the street and would try to stay close. Okay, guys, I want you to start thinking Florida versus JL style, right? Is it highly likely that this is going to be a truly anonymous tipster? Tell me. If we call this number back, who are we getting? Some lady right? Some customer at McDonald's. And so we call back and we're like, hey, did you, you know, who, who borrowed your phone earlier? She's like, I have no idea, right? So play it safe, right? See why you're A and treat a situation like this, like truly anonymous, because am I going to be able to find this kid again? I don't know, right? And so if I don't know, then I have to proceed like it's truly anonymous. Multiple officers arrive, they find the gray greenish charger, they block it in, they down everybody at gunpoint, they frisk the occupants, they find two illegal handguns. Are we good? Yes or no? 
Defense attorney argues Florida versus JL. In response, you say this is not Florida versus JL because. Ah. Ah. Fair enough. It's Florida versus JL. Okay. High crime area. Does that help you? Absolutely. Contemporaneous. Does that help you? Absolutely. First hand information. Does that help you? Yes, it does. Detailed description of vehicle. Does that help you? Yes. Proper motive? Assumedly, I don't know. What's the future harm? Okay. What does it mean that boys are out here playing with guns? What does that mean? Right? If you walk by me and I'm sitting in a car, right? And I've got my shooter out in my hand and I'm just looking at it and I'm talking to it. And I'm like, baby, you so pretty. You keep me so safe. Mm, you know, I love you, right? I'm gonna get you home tonight. I'm gonna strip you down. I'm gonna oil you up, right? Don't look at me like you don't talk to your gun that way because you know you do. If somebody walked by and saw me doing that, might they very well call the police and say, hey, there's some guy out here. <laughs> I don't know what he'd say, but might he say playing with guns? Maybe. Is that a crime, right? Is that a crime? If that's a crime, take me to jail, baby. Take me to jail. I'm guilty, right? So that's not a crime. What's the risk of future harm there? There's none, okay? Phone can't be traced to caller. That's a big one. Open carry is not illegal in the state. No other crimes alleged. No weapons seen upon arrival. This is Florida versus JL, okay? This is Florida versus JL, okay? All right. A mere possibility of unlawful use of a gun is not sufficient to establish reasonable suspicion. It must instead be sufficiently probable that the observed conduct suggests unlawful activity. And the connection to unlawful activity is just too speculative here. Boys could be a generic term for men of any age, and playing with guns could mean displaying them, which is not criminal conduct. Lacking detail, the report of guns in public does not suggest likely criminal activity. So if it's not Florida versus JL, tell me why it's not. All right. Unprovoked flight. Case on point here, Illinois versus Wardlow, right? Illinois versus Wardlow. And so officers respond to a high crime area. They pull in late at night and they pull in kind of like in a, uh, in a caravan, right? And as they do, Wardlow sees them, right? Looks left, looks right, and just takes off running. And so the officers get out and they chase him. And as they're chasing him, right, he throws a bag, whack, ultimately it's rock cocaine, okay? And so they grab him, they tackle him. And the question is, did they have RS? And the answer is yes. The court said unprovoked flight, high crime area equals reasonable suspicion, okay? Headlong flight, the consummate act of evasion is the opposite of ignoring the police and going about one's business, all right? There you go. I love it, right? I love that. Everybody, Chris has got the quote, okay? Chris has got the quote. An individual's presence in a high crime area standing alone is not enough to support a reasonable particularized suspicion of criminal activity. But a location's characteristics are relevant in determining whether the circumstances are sufficiently suspicious to warrant further investigation, okay? Now, Jorge, right? Jorge, yeah, okay, we're talking about state versus Flores, right? California Supreme Court, it didn't change. It didn't change, all right? It didn't change. Here's what I'll tell you. California is required to interpret their state constitution in keeping with the federal standard. Illinois versus Wardlow is good case law. And so I believe the California Supreme Court was a little bit off on that one. For those of you guys who don't know, officers pulled into a high crime area. In fact, the officer involved had arrested a drug dealer in this cul-de-sac the night before, right? And so they pull into the area and they see a guy duck down behind a vehicle. No other vehicle traffic in the area, no other foot traffic in the area. And he hides behind this vehicle for like 15 seconds. And the officers get out after 15 seconds and walk over and look around the vehicle, shine their flashlights. And he's still like crouched down there, like doing this. And they're like, bro, what are you doing? Show me your hands. And so he does. They look into the vehicle that he identifies as his drug paraphernalia inside the vehicle. Ultimately, they find meth inside the vehicle and a gun. Right. And United California Supreme Court says, no, that's not RS. Right. 
California Supreme Court referenced the lower court level and said, exactly, I'm just messing with my shoes. They said, you know, um, people of uh, minor minority heritage, um, but, you know, they, they might have an aversion to police and might want to avoid police, right? And so the question is, can California overrule um, Illinois, well, War, Illinois versus War, or Wardlow, uh, Illinois versus Wardlow? The answer is no, right? The answer is no, they can't. Uh, and they're actually required per their state constitution to interpret in keeping with Illinois versus Wardlow. So we're going to see. We're going to see how that one comes out, right? I wouldn't, I wouldn't put too much stock in it. And I would articulate, 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 okay? Any refusal to cooperate without more does not furnish the justification needed for a detention or a seizure. But unprovoked flight is simply not a mere refusal to cooperate. Flight, by its very nature, is not going about one's business. In fact, it is just the opposite. It was Wardlow's unprovoked flight that aroused the officer's suspicion. Nervous, evasive behavior is another pertinent factor in determining reasonable suspicion. And headlong flight is the consummate act of evasion. In reviewing the propriety of an officer's conduct, the reasonable suspicion determination must be based on common sense judgments and inferences about human behavior. Chris, what is it they say about common sense? California Supreme Court can tell you. All right, so talk about Terry Stops. Underlying criminal activity for unprovoked flight, right? Why do you think it's, un what do you think is the, under, the, the underlying criminal activity? If you're going to tell me this is a high crime area, you have to tell me why. Don't just throw that out there like some rote boilerplate phrase, right? If it's a high crime area, tell me why. Number of arrests, uh, calls for service, right? Statistics, shootings, robberies, whatever it is, right? Tell me. Articulate why he knew you were a cop. What is their immediate response going to be? I didn't know it was a cop, right? I thought it was just some guys who were going to come kick my ass, whatever it is. And then describe their flight, right? It wasn't like, oh, he turned around and began walking away from me, right? He took off running, right? He ran so fast, his pants fell off. He ran out of his shoes. Describe the flight, all right? Give me unprovoked flight plus, right? I'll tell you guys, right? We talk about unprovoked flight and it's like, it's like, oh, you know, it was, it was, it was high crime area and unprovoked flight equals RS. Give me more than that, right? You got to be able to give me more than that. Articulate these factors. I know you're going to see it. It's just a matter of pulling it back and later on and being able to articulate it in your report, right? High crime area, nervous, evasive behavior, time of day, number of people in the area, was the officer in uniform? What was the suspect's clothing, right? Tell me why. What do you guys think? Unprovoked flight? There it was, right? There it was. So, pat downs. The ultimate question with regard to a Terry stop, okay, is would a reasonable person believe they could ignore you without legal repercussions? Police lawfully begin to pat down a suspect and lift his shirt to see his waistband. Is this a frisk, right? Is this a frisk? Terry, stop. Reasonable suspicion that the person is, was, or about to be engaged in criminal activity. Terry, frisk. Reasonable suspicion, more than a mere hunch to believe this person is armed and dangerous. Is this a frisk? The answer is no, right? A frisk is a brief pat down of the exterior of the clothing. This is a search, all right? This is a search. Under plain feel, you can seize something if it's immediately apparent as contraband, evidence, or fruits or instrumentalities of a crime. Police detain a suspect because he may have robbed a suspect of a watch. During a pat down, you feel a watch in his right front pocket. What do you think? Can you seize it? It's immediately apparent without manipulation as a watch. Absolutely. And articulate why it's unusual for somebody to have a watch in their a wristwatch in their pocket. Okay. Officers lawfully patted down a suspect. He felt a small lump that he knew was not a weapon. He told the court, as I pat searched the front of his body, I felt a lump, a small lump in the front pocket. I examined it with my fingers and slid it. And it felt to be a lump of crack cocaine in cellophane. Minnesota versus Dickerson tells us Plain feel has to be immediately apparent without manipulation. Does this sound like manipulation? That sounds like manipulation. The court decided he manipulated the item before he had PC. It was narcotics. Not plain feel. The officers continued exploration of the defendant's pocket after having concluded that it contained no weapon 
was unrelated to the sole justification of the search under Terry, the protection of the police officer and others nearby. Is a person's generalized criminal history enough to conduct a pat down? Okay. Is a person's criminal history a factor in identifying a reasonable suspicion and in identifying probable cause? The answer is yes, it absolutely is, right? I, as a law enforcement officer, can take someone's criminal history into account. If they've been arrested previously for assault with a deadly weapon, is that a factor I should consider? If they have previously been arrested for attempted murder, is that a factor I should take into consideration to whether to determine whether or not they're armed and dangerous? It absolutely should. But their criminal history alone is not enough to conduct a pat down. Not enough, right? A factor, not the factor. On 4 16 21, at approximately 20 42 hours, I was operating as Mark Patrol 4, Mary 7. I observed a black Dodge Ram bearing license plate Nevada, Adam, Victor, Victor, Edward, Nora, George. At the intersection of Las Vegas Boulevard, a standard records check revealed that the vehicle had expired registration. The vehicle stop was conducted. The driver was asked to step out of the vehicle and was placed in front of our patrol vehicle. The driver was identified as Jones. Due to Jones' prior arrests, including assault with a deadly weapon, a frisk for weapons was conducted, and a firearm was found in the center console. Beautiful, right? But it's not enough. You got to tell me more, right? You got to tell me more. If it was just his prior history, that is not reasonable suspicion to believe he is currently armed and dangerous, right? Take, for example, John Ponder. He is a three-time felon. Extensive criminal history. Former gang member, former drug addict. When he teaches, when he presents, he likes to joke. And maybe it's not a joke. Maybe he's being serious. He likes to joke that he has a rap sheet longer than his leg, right? And I don't know, right? I don't know. So based on those facts, is that a criminal history that more than likely supports a uh, reasonable suspicion the person is armed and dangerous? Absolutely. Should you be frisking this guy? Well, I'll tell you today, he is the founder for hope of Hope for Prisoners. He's helped over 4,700 felons with re-entry into society. His organization works with Las Vegas Metro and is endorsed by the sheriff. So, if you stop John during a traffic stop, would you pat him down only because of his criminal history and his being in a high crime area? I sure hope not. The 10th Circuit has recently reiterated that standing alone, a criminal record, let alone arrests or suspected gang affiliation, is not sufficient to create reasonable suspicion of anything, right? Otherwise, any person with any sort of criminal record, or even worse, a person with arrests but no convictions, could be subjected to a Terry-type investigative stop by a law enforcement officer at any time, okay? And again, we're seeing this out of Colorado, we're seeing this out of the 10th Circuit, a lot of hostility. You have to articulate, 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 articulate. Tell me why. Tell me all the factors that you have identified that support reasonable suspicion and tell me not only what you see, but what it means to you. All right, guys, three big takeaways. Police must articulate suspicious, specific facts for Terry stops, right? Specific, suspicious facts. Say that five times fast. Unprovoked flight may be grounds to detain. Once your reasonable suspicion is dispelled, they must be released, right? What is the acceptable duration of a citizen stop, right? A detention. Well, a reasonable amount of time. Okay, well, what is that? How long does it take you to diligently pursue the mission of the stop? Diligently pursue the mission of the stop. Once your suspicions are confirmed, well, that's probable cause arrest. Once your suspicions are dispelled, release them immediately and go on your way or convert it into a consensual encounter. All right. Beautiful. Okay. Now you guys, I see people throwing numbers out there. Don't give me a specific number. Do you know why? It depends. Well, unless you're in Nevada, if you're in Nevada, give me a specific number and say like, let whatever whatever way the arrow the it, it eats the bigger number less than 60 minutes right yeah nevada's got their whole 60 minute it's an arrest yeesh okay so diligently pursue the mission to stop either confirm those suspicions and make the arrest once the sus suspicions are dispelled release them immediately however long it takes you to diligently pursue the mission of that traffic stop depends on what crime you are investigating the more serious the crime 
the more reasonable your actions are likely to be viewed. All right, guys, don't go anywhere because we've got some trivia time coming up and then we're going to do the search and seizure show. But here's what I ask, all right? We put these trainings on for free for you guys. We say they're free. They're really not. There is a high price to pay that we ask for. If you guys would, please give me a review. Give the class a review. Scan these QR codes. Help us out, right? You guys all know law enforcement officers are naturally cynical and not trusting, right? And so nothing helps us get the word out like peer reviews, okay? Nothing makes us, you know, prouder to do what we do and nothing helps us get this word out to other law enforcement officers like police officers who have taken our classes, endorsing our product and saying, hey, this is valuable. This is not a waste of your time, all right? So if you guys would, please scan these QR codes for us, right? Scan the QR code for me, scan the QR code for the Terry Stops. Give us your review, give us your feedback. Um, I'm going to give you guys, we're, we're going to take three, we're going to take three minutes so that you guys can, uh, you know, be inspired to do that. Yep. There you go. There you, right. Chris says, you know it, right. You know, every single one of you guys is looking at those Amazon reviews before you make that daily purchase. All right. Before you make that daily purchase. And I will tell you guys, I don't know what your experience has been, but man, every time I leave a review on Amazon, Amazon's like, hey, yeah, sorry, we're not going to post your review for any number of our reasons. Please review the, <laughs> the policy. And I'm like, this is what you guys do. This is how you keep the man down. You keep the truth from other buyers. Anyway, that's another thing. That's my own personal thing. All right, guys, take a couple minutes. Give us a review. 